Hello, and thanks so much for listening to this episode of Don't Filter Feelings. I'm Lauren Layfield, and on this podcast, we have conversations about issues that matter with people who have stories to share. Now, you may have heard about far-right extremism on TV or social media, and that is what we're going to be talking about in this episode today. I'm with Nigel Bromage, Rishi Nair, and Ray Quinn. Nigel, Rishi, and Ray, welcome to Don't Filter Feelings. And um, We're currently recording this podcast on the set of Hollyoaks. Nigel, anything like your living room this? Um, not really, no. <laughs> What's the differences? Um, yeah, you've got a teller, you know what I mean? Coming from Birmingham, we've just about got electric. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody who lives near Birmingham, I'm going to say I can laugh at that one. <laughs> Every week on Don't Filter Feelings, we, um, we want to ask our guests, how are they feeling right now? Nigel, kick us off. Um, yeah, fine, relaxed, you know. I'll find out what I tell you works now on my phone. Fair, fair enough, fair enough, Ray. Yeah, am I feeling right now? Yeah. R- really good. Honestly? Yeah, a bit hot, I'll be honest. It's yeah. a bit warm, isn't it? Yeah, but, you know, we've got the H2O map either, yeah. it's all good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm feeling good, yeah. Rishi? Uh, Ever done a podcast before? No, I'm a bit nervous, to be honest. I'm a bit uh, oh, nervous on this podcast. Why? What makes you scared? I don't, I just, I'm just scared of doing interviews in general, so... Uh, and, and the cameras are on, the lights mm. are on, the mics are on. I think you'd be used to this, wouldn't and you? Know, you know, know that you is would, you would literally so. your job. <laughs> uh, that's very true. <laughs> you have to get used to it at some point. <laughs> so today we are talking about far-right extremism. It's a big subject. Um, Nigel, can you tell us, sort of kick things off, for anybody who doesn't really understand what that is, what is far-right extremism? Well, um, simply put, far-right extremism is basically like an ideology based on superiority. So if somebody is white, they feel they're superior to somebody else, and they want to um, basically build a stronger, greater nation, uh, and that obviously leads to the detriment of everybody else who lives in that country who's of a different colour. Nigel, can you take us back and sort of talk us through... What was your involvement? Why are you here talking to us about it today? Yeah, I mean, I spent 20 years involved in the far right. Um, I initially joined at school when I was 15. Um, Somebody gave me a leaflet about um, the IRA and the IRA bombings in the 1980s. And uh, through just one picture, a picture of an IRA victim, I then got involved in, you know, the far right and spent 20 years in it. Um, You know, joining different groups from the National Front, the British Movement, being onto more extreme near Nazi organisations. And, you know, I embraced it totally. It It was my life at the time. Let's take it all the way back then. So you're, was it 15, 16? 15. 15 years old. So... Uh, well, where did the leaflet come from? How did this kind of end up in, in the hands of a 15-year-old? Um, somebody standing outside a school gate, as simple as that, and they were there distributing leaflets. Um, I took the leaflet, and, you know, it was a 15-year-old then. Something just clicked inside me. I thought, do you know what? Something's got to be done about terrorism. And, and, and it. obviously, um, we're talking 20 years ago, so can you tell us a little bit about what the kind of world was like back then in terms of why this imagery was was being given to you yeah i mean at the time the um, you know the ira were fighting for independence for ireland they were attacking soldiers they were planting bombs on the mainland um and just like you've got you know continuous terrorist attacks today on the television um you had the same then mm-hmm. and i think the fact that you know those images were like bombarded as a young individual uh, you know and, and somebody really like gave me a key to get involved and do something and it was very very much about, you know, you weren't joining a, an organisation like the National Front, which was racist, you know, I joined something called Birmingham against the IRA, mm-hmm. and at the time I just thought, you know what, it's standing up for Britain, it's anti-terrorist, it's okay. So it wasn't necessarily a um, colour or race issue or anything like that at that point? No, definitely not, that came later, so it was very much just about fighting terrorism, and, you know, I don't, I don't actually know to this day what a 15-year-old could have done against the IRA, obviously, mm-hmm. but the fact actually that the marketing, the imagery, was so good it had that appeal um and you know and I, I just took it on board straight away and and so where did it go from there from being a child who has obviously been given what is quite explicit material for, for a kid to have in their hands at that point the, what did you do next with it what what was your kind of thought process about what, what i'm going to do now with this um, i spent really six months just attending meetings going on marches trying to stop the ira marching in different cities um eventually found out that it was a front for the national front um once so that f- wasn't clear to you at the beginning no it was very and they said you know if we'd give you a national front leaflet then what would you have done and i said i'd have stuck it in the bin you know i got black and asian friends i've yep. got an opinion of them uh, which wasn't very good mm-hmm. um however they 
said, this is why we recruit on a single issue. Oh, um, and like very much like today, you know, people will recruit on things like grooming and terrorism. It's that single issue now mm. that recruits people a lot easier, you know, than having multiple issues because you might disagree with one or mm. two. I have to say, Nigel, it was a massive part of our research in the beginning when the storyline even came to us, you know, I got the part in Hollyoaks and I didn't fully understand or know anything about what Johnny was going to be like. I mean, I got told he was a nice guy and he was a bit of a lad and he would chat to people and and things like that. He was a bit of a confident geezer. And then when we came in to have the research chat and I found out really truly what Johnny was going to be eventually. Mm -hmm. And we had the research chats with Nigel and and a few others from a a company called Exit UK, which now work with young children who are, you know, you must know this, who now work with children who are trying to get out Mm-hmm. Of the of the manipulation and, and and the violence that happens within units like that when they draw them in mm-hmm. without any anything to do with race or anything. it's drawing in from mm-hmm. a picture it could be from anything and and totally. he's working with young children you know helping them escape because that is a really interesting thing isn't it we think that anyone who must have joined the national front or any of those kind of organisations must be straight up a racist person like that's it's black and white as that isn't it but it's actually so there's different yeah. ways of people yeah. getting in and being indoctrinated into people this. don't wake up and all of a sudden that you know adolf hitler's the greatest man walking and mm-hmm. i'm going to be a, you know i'm going to be a nazi i'm going to be a national socialist you know we've we've got to look at these naturally people are trying to be groomers mm-hmm. and these are what these guys are doing they think they're recruiters but actually what they're doing is they're grooming young people and vulnerable adults um, into extremist groups mm-hmm. and actually all you're treated is cannon fodder because the ones in the inner core, they will look after themselves completely. Mm. Whereas actually, if you're just on the sidelines leafleting or stickering or marching, you know, you're expendable. Mm. If you go to prison, they do not care about Classical you. Collateral damage, that's all it is, waivers. Yeah. And that's that's everything what we chatted about in the beginning before I even started as Johnny in, in Hollyoaks. Um, it was an absolute eye-opener, you know. I mean, I blew me away, some of the stories and books and things that I've read over the time just to do research to a new where I was coming in with would be believable in a way you know yeah, yeah. As, as believable as we, we can show at 6.30 at Hollyoaks but very brave at Hollyoaks to be able to do something I'd, like absolutely this, 100% it? it's certainly not something that I've seen I've maybe watched things in like a single drama or something that's on late at night you mm-hmm. know but it's it's not something I've seen tackled Hollyoaks you know, first tea time soap. yeah Hollyoaks you know. first soap to, to tackle anything. yeah quick 30 seconds give us a, a little bit of a fill in about what's actually happening on Hollyoaks right now with your characters Okay, so I think uh, Johnny and Stuart have just come in and they've, in a nutshell, sort of uh, groomed Stee. They've got very right-wing ideologies. Yeah. Um, and We target and, the Maliks. Yeah, the, because, exactly, yeah. yeah, because we know Stee uh, is, had a bit of an upset recently with him losing his sister. Uh, and we see a, a vulnerability there uh, and an ideal situation for us to hone in on Stee, manipulate him, groom him into a situation to join our group and our form and our um, our whole movement um, so we you know target the Maliks um, and and it gets out of hand a lot of times yeah it starts off very small little mm-hmm. things a little comment here and there and then it just escalates doesn't it and yeah it gets to the point where you know Sammy gets attacked there's been bacon put through their letterbox mm-hmm. and, and right up until a, a bomb going off what actually do you get up to when you're a part of a of a group like that? What is day to day like? What are you expected to do? What's your role like? How does it actually work? I mean, sort of obviously because we engage with people today. I mean, today basically the majority of what these guys do is online. You know, mm, it's I mean, a different. It's a totally different world, world now, right? really. I mean, seventy percent of the people we engage with now they've all been recruited online. Mm. Um, very rarely do you meet somebody in the pub or at the football now and get a mm. leaflet and you get recruited that way, mm-hmm. because you know the phone is there twenty four seven. So no matter when you're awake, you can just click on and you can find an extremist message. Mm. And when we talk to young people, we explain you know you might be talking to uh, Michelle who you think is 16 mm. um, but actually predominantly it's normally going to be a 40 year old man sitting in his bedroom with a list of profiles everybody from ex-squaddies to elderly ladies to mm-hmm. you know uh, young people 
and actually all those profiles have set messages and it's about recruiting numbers oh. and then you know so you, I, I honestly thought that if you were recruited these days that it would be just somebody going yeah hey yeah I'm from the National Front just wonder if you're up for this but you're right it's not they're posing they're in the guise of somebody else yeah, of course you do that you, you tend to you know you tend to get a, a lot of abuse or just yeah. completely ignore and people walk away with you mm-hmm. and, and also you know if you're leafleting you might go out and leaflet you know a whole house in the state and it'll take you months mm-hmm. whereas you know at a flick of a button you can get to thousands of people mm-hmm. and you've took 20 or 30 seconds to put out a message. So when you and, were involved in it then was it were you the old fashioned kind of way of going around and, and leafleting and, and trying to get people on board or how, how what did you have to do? Um, I mean we leafleted we stickered spray painted you know we were we tried to take over areas we would intimidate ethnic communities living in those areas mm. um, you know we, we, I actually got involved you put a burning cross in somebody's garden uh. um, as you was entering our estate it says you know you are now entering British movement territory oh. so the minute you got off the bus you know actually if you were an ethnic minority mm-hmm. you were not welcome and then you know if people if you were a socialist or left wing you know you were basically tried to be persuaded to leave the area mm-hmm. and those activities still carry on today mm-hmm. but also the activities the activities are a lot online you know they're making memes threatening videos mm-hmm. instruction manuals this is all the continuous 24 hour operation what was the ideology that you were a part of I mean, really, it was a complete ideology of hate, you know, whether it was blacks, Jews, Catholics, Asians, it was actually all embraced, and actually we needed to stand up for the white race, and anybody who wasn't of the white race were the enemy. And and if I'm being honest, you know, they they were there to be taken out. And, you know, earlier we talked, obviously, about the fact that you didn't go into it necessarily setting out to target ethnic minorities, but at some point that came along. Where did the switch happen? Can you remember a point where you went... Actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that I've got with, with race now. Um, for me, if I'm honest, it was uh, when the National Front started talking about um, foreign aid. Um, my mum, unfortunately, at the time, she was actually dying of cancer when mm. I was 14. And the National Front used that and said, actually, if we stop foreign aid to places like India, you know, people like your mum who were dying of cancer, they could actually get, you know, that aid and that money and mm. that, you know, those drugs that she needed to survive. When I looked at that, I just then sort of flicked for, actually, this isn't just about terrorism, this is about people in other countries. Mm. And then when I explained how India was developing a nuclear weapon and why are we giving them aid, you then start going, actually, why are we giving them money? Mm-hmm. And then that's then when rice sort of comes into this thing and, oh, I don't want to give money to them. And then it's, oh, they're from Asia. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, I don't like the Asians, I don't like the blacks, I don't like this, I don't like the Jews. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, through this continuous manipulation of the continuous, you know, books, videos, etc., you just completely embrace it mm-hmm. and at the very end I was in an organisation called the Church of Crater and they had a saying called Rahoa and Rahoa means racial holy war and this is a worldwide church and you know this that church came into the UK in 1977 and you know these churches uh, you know they're still going today and they are operating within the far right groups to recruit those most hardcore activists mm-hmm. and it's really fascinating listening to you because it is, yeah on on paper you'd go I could never understand why somebody would be a part of the I could never understand why someone would be but when you speak about how they have related it back to your own personal experience it's not an understand it's not an understand I don't know how you guys think about it is it an understand do I understand that's, it? that's how it's easily recruited because they, they get to the core like as Johnny as, as in, in, in Hollyoaks he, every scene he gets to understand and he reads stay hey you know he reads him every single scene he does and it's like well I know what what he knows what he's going to say before I've even asked him the question mm. so it's 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 like that so it's that it's how isn't it's it? so it's so deeply manipulative it before they even say anything they know exactly what they're going to say where they're going to go how they're going to move and how they're going to react to whatever situation so they knew whoever it was on your side at the time yeah definitely only from my experiences playing Johnny and with the scripts and the writers and things that and the research that we did that if if there was a point where they thought they could get to your core get yeah. to your heart mm. and once that heart's been struck you know there's nothing bigger than that mm-hmm. to, to even I mean, try if somebody's taking your mom to chemo you know I mean your dad's working away as an HGV driver you know you think these people are normal mm. they're not 
fascists that don't walk around in swastika armbands mm. you know they're taking your mom to get a bear and all of a sudden you're going these people are actually normal they mm. care and then you think whatever you see in the press you think oh that's just lies you know they don't believe that you know because they're actually having an effect on your own personal life mm. and these guys are doing this day in day out whether it's feeding the homeless supporting people who are vulnerable um, you know they're very clever at what they do and I think we've got to be a bit more open and honest and say actually this problem is huge yeah. mm. and you know if, if people like Collie Oaks etc are taking this on board you know this is only going to get that message out to more people which more means more help and know, and know the signs I think as well definitely be your own person know what it is you want you know and don't be influenced by you know the people who you feel are a bit sort of you don't know who are asking you two deeper questions that you don't feel comfortable yeah. answering I'm really fascinated as well and 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 forgive me for sounding really blunt about it but I know you speak really like honestly and candidly about it so I hope you don't mind but you you would have behaved in a way that was racist yeah you would it be fair to say you were a racist yeah how how do you feel about that looking back on that now it's a bit like a different person it's really strange because i look at obviously myself now what i do you know i help people get out uh you know i you know attend any celebration where there's food and music i'm in doesn't care who's celebrating and it is very much about now i look back and it's, it looks like a completely different individual rishi if um do you mind me asking what your heritage is what's your family heritage? yeah my, my family from india yeah so how does it feel when you hear that kind of thing for you uh particularly when you've just said you know it's people from india who yeah, were, yeah. you know making the nuclear bomb and things like that like of it course, must be quite yeah. difficult for it's you. shocking it is shocking to hear i've never really been exposed to it so bluntly before have you ever sat across the table <laughs> I, do you know what? I probably things. have sat across the table from someone uh, who, you, who used to be like yourself, but probably not. He's probably or she has not been vocal about it. Exactly. You know, and I'm probably I've sat on the tube or on the train and people with those ideologies, but I've just not known about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really fascinating for me to hear that. Um, mm. And it was like when with you saying it was like, you know, hearing how they related it to your mum and and it, there is almost a sort of understanding of not why you did it but how you got brought into that and how they caught sort of uh you know almost just plucked you out and and just reeled you in slowly um it's scary it's it is scary and i think because where did it start before do you know what i mean who's groomed them and Mm. you know what came first the chicken or the egg it's one of them what goes next yeah what happens as well you know that doesn't stop you know because you you go in and you're actually trained and you have a small table like this and you will be trying to be a recruiter and then you have targets to go out and meet and certain types of people you will go and recruit Mm -hmm. and then every month you'll just meet and say how is this profile doing how that's profile doing and it's like a business Mm -hmm. you know I mean these guys do set up businesses printing shops local grocery shops you know security firms all that money then goes into the movement and then you worry then about where is this money going and what's it buying and so you stayed within these organizations organizations for 20 years yeah what kind of kept you in it i guess kept you in it so long most people are in it for life aren't they but what 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 was it that kept you hooked in what did you want to achieve um comradeship and friendship without a doubt uh, and unfortunately my mom did pass away when i was 18 mm. uh, dad got killed in a car crash when i was 23 mm. um you know no brothers no sisters the far right with the family, the family and, yeah. and you know if they ask for absolutely anything you do it without a doubt you know you'd have people arrive from holland and they'd stay in your house for three days you wouldn't really know where they are and then they disappear in the morning and there's a thank you note you know it was just a case you looked after everybody regardless of who they were um, but it's only then when you start having those doubts you can't talk to a friend in the movement and go oh, I'm not really sure about that right like, <laughs> yeah because, what was, if you mentioned that within the movement what would be what would happen um, we just get put, ratted out basically uh, yeah without that exactly like obviously what happened in the storyline you know you'd be set up to be pulled in the leader then the organiser would basically ask you 101 questions and if you didn't answer it correctly you'd end up with a, a kick in so 20 years you were in it what was the turning point that made you and how did you get out if it was that coercive how did you get out of it all um it was over a three-year period at the very end that i decided this is not the place but what the hell do i do about it um the the first point was uh, you know i was married at the time uh, my wife hated politics um she gave me an ultimatum um basically combat 18 or her mm-hmm. uh, my choice was combat 18 and um, because i was groomed that much to say actually you're expendable and you know you know 
say, yeah, I love you very much, everything else, but actually the movement's far more important. Wow. And you just walk away. Mm. Um, and, you know, that can be even be now spoke to individuals who will turn on their own children because, you know, they're listening to, you know, Stormzy or drill music or whatever it is, mm. and they've betrayed the race, so we're not going to listen to you. They've got a black boyfriend, you know, they just sent off then to auntie or granny and you know that's it they're out the family because the movement is the be all and end all of life yeah yeah and so what how did you actually end up end up leaving um i I sort of planned really for three years didn't speak to anybody then decided to sort of go and sort of live in london for a couple of years um you know destroyed all communication give up my job friends you name it (coughs) then basically just got my head together really for a two-year process and then eventually come back to to sort of you know birmingham my city um and then it was very much like what do i do about it now and then then you try and make amends for all the bad that you've done so all i got involved in community work you know youth work you know anything really that could make up really amends for the the, the awful stuff that i did in the past Mm. Very in your head in London now for three years and then walking back to your city must have been so terrifying. Mm. It, it, you know, I had to have a conversation, like an interview with the far right, and they basically told me what industries I could work in, really? um, where I could work, that I couldn't talk about, obviously, why I'd left. Because, obviously, if you admit you've left, because, you know, if somebody walks away from, you know, being an organiser of, of these organisations, that leaves a huge hole because everybody then starts to doubt. Or if mm. he's had doubts after 20 years, yeah. is it wrong? It's, it's like the cancer of the kind of system then isn't it and Definitely. they think it's going to spread and so you then talk about actually oh he left because of health reasons or we had to go for family or education or work there's always an excuse it's never oh he's, he's turned the other cheek and left mm. us there's always a reason why and then to be come back and be told you know about where you can live and what where God. you can work that was just uh, you know it was something I was willing to do at the time just to to get back to you know which was home yeah yeah and, and the- if you if you see these people in the street like who you, you st- mm. are you a target for them now? Um, I mean, they hate me with a vengeance, you know, because I'm, I'm a movement traitor. I've turned the back on the movement. Everything I've ever said and believed in previously, I've you know, I've turned my back and said, "Oh, that's wrong." So yeah, it's um, you know, I've had to move houses and do different things to get away. Can't go to certain pubs, certain areas, etc. So every time you're just sort of looking over your shoulder, thinking, mm. "Is today the day?" Mm. And you just you just don't know. Yeah. And in terms of you saying you wanted to kind of correct your wrongs, how how can you forgive yourself for something that was such a huge part of your life for such a long time? You just have to accept what you've done, what you've said, um, all the actions you've ever done. Um, you can't turn the back the past you know i mean those things have been done but it's about what we do now moving forward Mm -hmm. so for me now i can use my stories and other people's stories and we can say actually extremism's wrong don't get involved but if you know if you are involved everybody deserves a second chance even if somebody's a hardcore neo-nazi if society doesn't accept that that person deserves a chance then they will stay stuck in that rut Mm -hmm. and all we're going to get is a more violent society it's going to continue surely without a Out. if we don't show some element of empathy i guess yeah. which is what's brilliant about what's happening on hollyoaks right now and so you've been involved with um advising the guys on yeah what that lifestyle's like i guess yeah we've been talking about what it, what the activities you do things like the initiations that you go through the activities um you know people that you view as enemies what what you would and wouldn't do at certain times um and it's all about testing things out and then you realize if you can get away with intimidation you'll do that um but it is you know it's been really portrayed well and we're really pleased how so how's it been you. for you then ray like obviously what a job to take on yeah yeah, I mean, the research, I've got to admit, has been phenomenal with Hollyoaks. Uh, the writers, the producers, we've put a lot of trust in them uh, quite great, like quite, you know, easily, to be honest, because they, the research they've put in and the hard work and dedication to this storyline before it was even announced was unbelievable. And then the research that I took on board myself after meeting with Nigel and a few others and stuff, and then, you know, I, f- I found, like, my niece says Johnny and, and, and found that if I was this way and if I was that way and if I acted that way, I, I just wanted it to be believable because as an actor, as, as a baddie, you know, I guess... <laughs> it's a lot you villain it's, you yeah it's a lot easier as an actor because there's so much more choice mm-hmm. as a body you know you can be the menacing guy you can be this crazy psycho guy or you can be quite you know 
plain mm. you know and, and not have any emotion um, whereas Johnny's sort of somewhere in between the three he's a bit of a, an, an unfiltered geezer you know at, at times but then he, he's very like you don't really know what's going on mm. uh, at the time so uh, it's been fun it's been enjoyable to, to a degree uh, just more from an acting perspective because I've never been given the opportunity before to play someone so different to my own personality mm. uh, even in the slightest you know I've been Danny in Greece and I've been things like that I've been like legally <laughs> Warner Huntington and legally blonde I was on Brookside as a quite, kid it's not quite like, the same yeah, is it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when I was on Brookside as a child I, I played like a, a young school boy who was a choir boy and, you, you ever know, played a was, choir boy Nigel no anything? definitely yeah, not he was, bullied, <laughs> he, was, he was bullied by girls in his school you know that, that was me when I first started here you know 20 odd years ago Um and 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 but then to, to be given the opportunity and the belief of, if you like from from the cast and directors and and Holly Oaks themselves to give me the opportunity to try something new I, again really opened my eyes and I just wanted to do it justice and I, I've definitely enjoyed it uh, being here and, and working in this environment. Have you found it hard work though? Like you said, like it was one leaflet for you I was that just kind of say. just switched, yeah. But you're obviously consuming a load of material about it within months, yeah, or well, weeks, yeah. But the, I think the most difficult part of it is, you know, when you're on set you sort of feel overly apologetic you know you're like you're all right you know or mm. I'll say you know there's a guy who came in, in the as a nurse and I'm shouting awful stuff on him through the hallway and obviously he's only come in for the day <laughs> <laughs> as an extra uh, oh, walk on three if you know what I mean <laughs> and I've said mate listen just so you know it's just, <laughs> I'm not really like this yeah this I is promise. not what, yeah <laughs> I mean, I went to a, a, a coffee shop without mentioning names and I'm about to order me coffee and the, the fella's saying, what would you like? And the lady came from behind the, the counter randomly and just shouted there, don't be saving him, he's a racist. <laughs> then I laughed and went, oh, ha, ha, thinking, oh, she must watch Hollyoaks. The fella's looking at me like, scared, <laughs> almost like, what, what do I say? And I said, oh, uh, you know, just so you know, mate, I, I play... Johnny and Holly Oaks, he's a bit of a this, that, and the other. And he went, oh, sorry, mate, don't watch it. Didn't realise I thought she was being serious for the minute there. But if I was a shy fella, oh, there's no way I would have said, oh, you know, I would have just gone along with my coffee and walked out going, oh, my God, I can't go in there again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's been a, a massive learning curve, I think, for me, uh, but enjoyable at the same time, just from a performance and, and an acting perspective, mm. you know, because getting stuck into a role that is, is completely out of my comfort zone, com completely to something that I don't understand, never did understand and didn't know about. Yeah. Mm. And so many people don't. When they gave me the call and said, this is what you're going to be talking yeah. about today, yeah. I was just like, that's legit exciting. It yes. was. I was excited to come and do this because it's nothing that I've, I've ever had the opportunity to sit down and say, well, how? Why? Yeah, it's, and that yeah. was, it's very intriguing. And it's very it's interesting. Very in in really interesting. I find myself switching off and just listening. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. it's all... It's it's fascinating, it really is, and and I think that was the thing for me. I, I just I've just enjoyed it and and soaked it up as mm. far as this, you know my, my acting and, and things like that. Getting back into it after so many years or whatever, um, but it, it's been difficult mm. at the at the beginning knowing the, how big the challenge was and the pressure but, to get it right. Uh, exactly, because like you, you don't want to upset either party, and at the same time, I, I like a challenge. So yeah, was, <laughs> I love it. And Rishi, what about for you? You're obviously playing someone who is being targeted mm. by this group. What is that like? Um, it is challenging because the scenes that we're doing obviously are not nice scenes to film. You know, they, they can be quite. Oh, it's quite it's gut wrenching. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, it is tough. Of course, it's tough. I think it's more tough for me when I first read the scripts. When I take them home and I read them, and I think, God, this is shocking. This is really mm. shocking stuff, and and rightly so because it is shocking, and and it that is real life. You know, racism is never done in a fairy dainty way. It is very shocking, and I think. You know, at first when I'm reading through the scripts and I'm seeing this and I'm trying to relate to it, you you know, from either personal experiences or from what people have said to me after watching the show, you know, you get messages on social media when people come up to you in the street telling you about their awful experiences. And, you know, all of those kind of emotions all kind of come back to you and... And it's quite emotional reading through that. And then obviously you start dissecting the script as an actor and you can kind of detach yourself from it. But obviously when you come back to do the scene and you, you know, you, you get yourself into that place, whether you're drawing it from personal experience or from someone else's experience, or you're just trying to picture Sammy, what he would feel like. Mm. It's not a nice place to go to. Mm. Um, and I you think do it go feels... home drained. Sorry, you do go home 
drained, don't you? We've course, had long, yeah. long days together, whether it be for the special eps or the longer eps or whatever it may be, uh, within the storyline as it's progressed. And you do go home feeling like just drained of like emotion because you know as yourself you go through that emotion and for me I'm like I'm mean and I don't have any feelings yeah. and it, it, I'm cold hearted you know and you go on going oh you know God, it's wow, exhausting it's, yeah. it is it's, it's it's does it take you a long time to switch off then you know when you're actually trying to come mm. out of a character yeah it's like when you get in the car it's when you're driving home and you sort of you don't have music on and then before you know it, you're outside your front door and you go I just sat <laughs> in silence for half an hour oh, no. <laughs> what's just happened it's God. basically yeah, it's, it's just filtering it out and letting it go and just going okay back to normal and um, sort of to wrap it up really what would you say to anybody listening who has been exposed to this stuff online who is thinking of joining these groups whatever it is what would you be your advice to them right now um, so simply just get in touch you know look at um, exituk.org um, there's a number of case study videos on there um, you know there's a contact email phone number if you get in touch with us we will you know either explain what it's like to get involved in these groups and it's not the place to join or if you're involved we can get you out um, it's not going to be easy you know you've got to be committed to the idea of doing that um, but if you are committed the help's there and you know and once you come out it's like you know it's like lifting a weight off your shoulders it's amazing Mm. um so just get in touch thank you nigel rishi and ray for joining us on don't filter feelings if you want more don't filter feelings you can search for the hashtag or check out hollyoaks on your social feeds and as always if you've been affected by anything you've heard on this podcast or seen in hollyoaks there's help and support over at channel4.com slash support we really hope you've enjoyed this podcast and it would be amazing if you leave us a rating and review the episode wherever it is you listen because more ratings and reviews means more people will hear about the podcast so please do take a second to spread the word for us coming up in the next episode of don't filter feelings just don't be horrible we do see it we are going to see it sometimes you know what i mean and we have got the same feelings you've got imagine i said it to you would you be happy